Hello and welcome to the Maidcast, the official podcast of the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment, a series of lectures on video game history as part of the Maid's ongoing effort to preserve history through teaching and displaying playable exhibits of rare games and consoles. The museum's new location is 921 Washington Street, downtown Oakland. Our hours are noon to 7 p.m. Wednesdays and Thursdays, 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. Fridays and Saturdays, and 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Sundays. For the past few years and still to this day, the support of people like you has allowed us to continue to bring history to you through lectures and interviews like the one you'll hear in a few minutes. One announcement, if you're going to be at GDC this year, The Maid will be returning to the expo floor. For those who don't know, the Game Developers Conference is a professional games industry event that takes place every year in San Francisco at the Moscone Convention Center. From March 22nd to 24th, you can find our exhibits at the Retro Arcade booth located in the North Hall of the Expo floor. We'll be showcasing some of the most iconic video games in the history of our industry and spotlighting some of the legends who made them. Hope to see you there. I'm Jed, and today I'll be joined by industry veteran Michael Myers, who was the executive producer of the syndicated show GamePro TV in the 1990s and has continued to work in games through his company Michael Myers Public Relations. We get into some stories from the early days of gaming and talk about how it has evolved in the decades since. I had a great time chatting with him and I hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome to the Maidcast. Today we are joined by Michael Myers, who formerly produced the show GamePro TV and now runs Michael Myers Public Relations. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, as is tradition on the Maidcast, what is your favorite game? Um, I would have to say right now it's probably Divinity 2. Okay. Um, I have put in more hours on that game than I think any game ever. Wow. I've played in my entire life. Not counting, maybe not counting arcade stuff because, you know, who was really tracking hours when you were playing at the arcade? <laughs> Uh, so you are tracking hours. May I ask how many hours you put into Divinity Two? Oh, I don't. I don't know what it is right now, but on, on Steam, I think you can you can look and see, and it, it, it's hundreds, hundreds okay. and hundreds of hours. I've played through multiple times, multiple character combinations, all sorts of expansions. You know, player created expansions and, and things like that. And you know, I, I just keep going back in. If I don't have anything to play that's brand new that's got my interest i'll jump back in there and do something else with it <laughs> so, what is it about that game that um, keeps coming back to me it's kind of like the perfect rpg the characters are interesting the storyline is real interest, or the multiple storylines is really interesting the battle the combat just that kind of isometric kind of hybrid turn-based battling is my kind of rpg it's I mean, it's got a really you say RPG, but it's definitely got a heavy dose of strategy and tactics as well. A ab absolutely. But it's not so hardcore, you know, strat. It's not like military strategy. It's I mean, you know, you you learn your characters, they get better and better. You start to figure out combinations of things like what what character works well with another character and how you should kind of level them up in certain skills so that you have a an ultimate powerful, you know, group. Yeah, so that game, I think, probably at this point, all time fave. That I, I've never jumped into it, but you're you're kind of selling me on it now. I, I remember seeing it when it came out and being like, oh, "That looks cool," and I never just never uh, went and revisited it. So, well, I want to I want to rewind a little bit because you did mention arcade games, and I I did happen to see that you once held the uh, high score for the arcade game Wizard of War. Oh, uh, God, I believe yeah. that was 1982. <laughs> Do you know if you if you still college. hold that record? <laughs> Wow, I have a Wizard of War machine. Nice. <laughs> it's okay. Not, it's not. It, it's not very functional right now, so I don't okay. think I could ever break a record on it. But um, if I got it, got the, got it fixed, or maybe I could. Um, I know people when they were keeping. Now you know. I think somebody probably knocked off that record, if I remember correctly. It was maybe I maybe it sat up there for about six months. Okay. Um, but it got me, you know, it got me, it didn't get me fame and fortune. It got me an interview with uh, Tiger Beat magazine, which mm -hmm. is <laughs> nice. probably one of the stranger interviews I've ever done. <laughs> also, uh, well, Tiger Beat, you know, if, if you remember those magazines from the seventies and eighties, there's, I think there was 16 and there was Tiger Beat and they were really aimed at women or girls, teen girls. And 
So, you know, they'd have their great photo feature on Eric Estrada or you know some <laughs> some TV star and then they'd be had this little bottom column. So Mike, what makes you a great Wizard of War player? And what 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 did you make you a, a great Wizard of War player? I'm curious. Well, um Wizard of War was in my mind the first true team up arcade game. You weren't mm. going to advance unless you had a good partner. Mm. And it was teamwork. You had to find the spot where you could go back to back and hold off the monsters for as long as you could by firing, you know, really, really fast. Um, and then when you got up into the maze levels or the or the big open areas where it's just sort of a free for all, you had to kind of understand the patterns of the monsters and be able to still, you know, continue on protecting each other's back. Right. Um, so I learned. I had a great partner. I, you know, I played at the uh, Temple University School School Activity Center Arcade, and I had a great partner, my friend Todd. And so we got really, really good um, playing together in that game. And then one day I was wandering around southern New Jersey and went to an arcade, and they had this Wizard of War machine, and they had this setting on it, like kind of a beginner setting. And so it was cake for me, for me. You know, I was used to playing it on this more advanced setting with a partner. So I was able to rack up a score, um, which went on to the record books. You know, I played by myself and kept it going for, I don't know, a good good hour maybe. And Wizard of War, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is, it looks a bit like a, a co-op maze game kind of a, a – a bit, a bit like Pac-Man, um, with some some shooting and some hiding elements as well. It's like it, it's kind of like a cross of Pac-Man and Berserk. Berserk is probably a yeah the best, the best description. I mean, yeah, to me, that's that's what it is. You get your your little maze set up, and you have your little monsters zipping around, and they start getting faster and faster, like Pac-Man. Um, randomizing patterns and then they throw an extra monkey wrench in there where the monsters start blipping out and going invisible and then reappearing mm. um and then you've got the the guy or the, the the creature that shows up before the wizard who will zip around shooting bolts and then sometimes you get the actual wizard of war who comes in going even faster shooting lightning bolts and worth worth big big points if you were to nail him before he leaves the screen so what was the transition from playing games to working in games for you? When I was 16, games started to show up. Um, my local ice rink, I think, got a Pong machine. So I was playing pinball at the local 7-Eleven. You know, you'd have three or four pinball machines. Um, arcades started to spring up and you'd see things like space wars and space invaders and, and stuff like that and and then the machines started to show up on the market the atari 2600 the mattel and television which was the machine that i fell in love with at least in the first generation um so they started to show up and i thought my parents weren't going to go out and buy me any any video game. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that they were anti-video game. I mean, you couldn't be anti-video game at that point because nobody really knew what it was. They just thought, well, this is a fad, you know, of some sort. Um, but I thought, you know, the only way I'm going to get these games is if I'm writing about them professionally and I find someone willing to pay me a dime or whatever for a column that has enough of a readership that makes it worth their while. And so I latched on with this local um, entertainment publication called the um, Home Viewer or the Philadelphia Home Viewer. And that was a, a publication that they had created because of the new trend of the VCR, you know, and this, this, publication came out there and reported all about what video tapes you could get or rent or buy this week on vhs or betamax because <laughs> betamax was still a thing sure and i proposed to them that we added a regular video game column because i said video games are going to be just as popular just you watch yeah and so i think they were paying me like 25 bucks a column and right. i didn't care because it was getting me all the machines and all the games and suddenly I was a stop on the great PR train for, you know, you go to New York and you see some journalists and then you pop down and you see me in Philadelphia. So 
So it started off just wanting free consoles and turned into a career. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, I mean, I, it. I mean, it obviously started off as a passion. You know, I had an immediate passion when I discovered video games in arcades, and when I saw my first home systems, there was a kid on the block. I think who had a um, a Fairchild F that he got. And I was just kind of blown away by that. Um, and then I we got... Have a, we have a Fairchild Channel F exhibit at the museum right now, actually. Yeah, that was a cool little machine. <laughs> um, and, you know, he had the Magnavox Odyssey with the stick, the plastic thing over your TV screen kind of thing. Um, and then I saw a demo of the Intellivision. And like I said, I fell in love and I, I saw, look at the sports, look what they're doing. Look, you know, and so it's like, I have to get a Mattel in television. I have to do this. Um, when and, you, when you went to that magazine and you said, you know, the games are going to be just as big as home video. Was that a fib or did you really believe that? No, I, I believed it, you know, at, at the time, I mean, we didn't, we didn't see the crash coming or any of that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, we just saw, I saw the arcades and the arcades were super popular and, and the way the games were advancing, you know, so quickly, um, you just knew, at least we thought the arcades were going to be around forever. That, that's right. what we thought. And then when they, they started building for the home and okay, so you had the Atari, you, you started with the Magnavox and it's like, well, that's pretty crude. And then the Atari comes out and it's like, well, that's more sophisticated. And then Mattel says, well, we're just going to double the amount of you know, memory in, the, in this machine from one to two bits. And look what <laughs> they can do. You know, Look at that jump they made. And then Coleco shows up and they're even more powerful. And suddenly the arcade games seem like you know, that they're converting, seem like decent experiences at home. And so right. I just thought it was just going to keep going. Um, and do you I, think it, it did I, to an extent? <laughs> One one little dip, you know, one little dip, yeah. the great crash. Um, but it, it did keep going. And so I believed that this is going to be home entertainment in the future. We're going to rent whatever movie we want on whatever form of cassette. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and then we'd have the video game machines attached to the same TV and you flip a switch and jump over there. And You weren't wrong. Yeah. Although yeah. we did move on from cassettes for sure. <laughs> and then at one point, at what point did you uh, see so you're writing for magazines and, and, and doing some freelance stuff and getting more and more involved in games? At what point did you get involved with uh, GamePro? Were you there for the beginning? I was um, not the very, very beginning. I think my first articles probably appeared by issue six, maybe. I was, I was, um, I had moved from Philadelphia at that point to Chicago, um, got married. My wife was from Chicago. We went there to pursue careers. I was an advertising major in college and the advertising, we had a recession in the advertising business and that made things a little tricky in Philadelphia. So we thought, well, you know, Chicago is a big advertising market. Let's, why don't we try Chicago and see how that goes. And so my wife got a job in Chicago I was doing a bunch of part-time, you know, work just trying to make ends meet. And that was when the rise of the Nintendo Entertainment System happened. And as luck would have it, four out of the five of the first companies making games for the Nintendo Entertainment System were based in the Chicago suburbs. Yeah. And I saw an ad. <laughs> hey. Um, we're looking for a product manager for a video game company. Must be love baseball must love video games let you know etc cetera, etc cetera. it's like ooh, somebody made a job for me <laughs> cool yeah um, got that job i actually started with a, a mac game company called icom simulations first for about six months they did uninvited and Shadowgate and all oh, really? those adventure games for the mac so i did a six month stint with them and then the job for jalico showed up got the job at jalico as a product manager, which was a very loose term for everything involving anything from game counselor to PR manager to game tester. To, yeah. Know. Um, but so, we don't know what to call this. So you just do everything else. Yeah, so I, I was a product manager for Jalico. And so that, that was my first, um, full time job in gaming. But I, okay. that, from that point I was in for good essentially. 
and it wasn't just a hobby to get free games anymore. What led to the creation of GamePro TV? GamePro, I got to GamePro, or was I was offered the position of senior editor coming into their second year of existence. And so we split the cold of Chicago and relocated to the lovely Bay Area, and I became senior editor at GamePro Magazine. Um, GamePro was talking with a company, Samuel Goldwyn, um, Samuel Goldwyn was a production company, and at that time, they had a hit, a, a one-year hit called American Gladiators. They talked about doing a Game Pro show based on the magazine that would take sections or segments of the magazine, and that we would turn them into parts of a TV show that ran for you know 24 minutes or 22 minutes. Um got it you know syndicated through Samuel Goldwyn so it would show up on your most major you know it would show up mostly I think we were mostly on ABC networks running on like Saturday morning the the show I think we were at about 300,000 subs- subscribers at that point and I think the show helped us double double our number so wow. yeah it was definitely we I think we had like a whole direct mail campaign we did in conjunction with the show and you know so it was a multifaceted marketing effort to get get the magazine to be the pure number one. And back then, you know, if you're your pure number one magazine, it means you're getting all the ad dollars and you're right. having more editorial pages and you know, everything's great. <laughs> yeah. And you talk about this boom of all these magazines coming out, you know, I guess in the early 90s. Um, it strikes me that that maybe part of the motivation for people wanting these magazines is specifically so that they can get the cheat codes and secret codes for their games that they're playing. Do you think that was like the motivating factor for a lot of people or, or what do you think it was? Yeah, the tips and tricks section was definitely hugely popular. But I think, you know, you didn't the internet wasn't really a factor at that point. So your source for what's coming out or what's coming out next, you're going to get it in the magazines. The great revolution, I guess, in in magazines was we got systems that would allow us to capture games, you know, frame by frame. And, and that was like the great revolution because, <laughs> because it used to be, yeah. you know, it used to, right before that, Electronic Gaming Monthly was running around like shows, you know, CES or Maybe was E three going at that point? Maybe not. But CES and they're slapping a cardboard cone over the monitor to block out all the light to try <laughs> to take a picture of the game that they're going to stick in their magazine. So we went from that sort of prehistoric system to now it's all electronic and we can right. freeze the game wherever we want and shoot the picture. And if you ever pick up an old Game Pro magazine, it's like this is a pretty colorful magazine between all the art and all the illustrations and the sheer quantity of screenshots we were putting in there. Yeah. yeah, it's a pretty entertaining magazine and very visual. So, so for our, our younger viewers who don't know, can you describe uh, going back to Game Pro TV? Can you kind of describe the format and maybe the aesthetic of the show? We had um, a host and a co-host. It was like JD Roth, who was like the world's um, youngest looking man. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like I don't know how old he was when he was doing the Game Pro show. I thought he was in his 30s, but he looked like he was 16, you know? Yeah. Um, so J.D. Roth, and and then he had kind of his co-host uh, guy, Brennan, Brennan Howard, who was kind of like, they used to call him B-Man, and he was he had this sort of surfer dude. Like if you can imagine, if you, or if you knew Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Jeff Spicoli, that's, that's Brendan Howard, you know, to try to do a Jeff Spicoli impression without the long blonde hair. Um, and so those two were going to roll through a certain amount of segments within each episode of the show. They would do um, pro tips and, you know, they would do tips, tips and tricks and show you stuff on video, like how to beat this boss or how to do this. They would have their preview or and pro view section review section we had our hot at the arcades um thing which was something i insisted on um as as producer because i wanted to get all the arcade games backstage for us um so we had our our hot at the arcades we had i think we were taking some letters and answering them on air you know um ask the pros 
Um, and you know, a, they, they pulled a couple other sections from the Game Pro regular Game Pro magazine, and that was the format of the show. Did you um, have any like prediction about you know? Because I guess nobody really knew if if a show where you you know you uh, explain how to beat a certain boss in a certain video game, nobody really knew if that kind of show would be successful. Um, so I guess did you have any predictions going into it, and like what what were kind of the the indicators of of what would be the response? Well, I think at that point, by then, we were starting to see people making videotapes of tricks, like they were making strategy tapes of you know beat this many games, and and it was just that's that's what they were producing, and they were you know showing up at the blockbuster, you know the big big video chain. I don't think I knew about that. And people were were getting them, you know, or they were buying them cheap at Walmart or <laughs> Kmart. Um, so I think it was already a thing. Um, but we knew just from the magazine, we knew which sections were most popular. And when we were doing surveys, Tips and Tricks was always coming up real high in the survey, if not the top. Um, yeah. And so you worked on uh, that show for how many seasons? Um, well, okay. I was the senior producer from the Game Pro side for the entire season one, which was like 24 episodes. That was, I think that was the only season where Game Pro staff was actually involved and on the set and fact checking and, you know, doing that kind of thing. Right. Um, the first 24 episodes of the syndicated show. The second season, we were producing footage for them but we weren't it was it was a much cheaper produced version of the show that they were building um and that was when it was out of syndication because we still wanted to sell magazines and you know the ftc wasn't allowing or the fcc wasn't allowing us to to call it a show anymore it was more editorial (laughs) right um so that's when they moved to syndic or they moved to cable and it was a quicker, cheaper produced show. Um, and I wasn't on the set for that. So. so from that, from that first season, when you were more hands on, do you have any stories from that era uh, that you remember? And it was a while back. Well, let's, I mean, it was, it was, it was a really hard job because they wanted to crank out those 24 episodes in like two weeks. So I think oh, we, wow. we did like 12 and 12. And, and it was just this breakneck pace, um, but a lot of fun. I mean, it was, it was pretty fascinating to watch the whole thing get put together and, and see the final product. I mean, story-wise, I think my, my, my most interesting story was probably what the show, what we were using the show for, and that was leverage. I think that's when I started to understand the kind of the ins and outs of being a public relations person, um, even though I was an editor at that point. We knew that everybody was essentially on an equal playing field when it came to the magazines, EGM, Game Pro, uh, Ultra Game Players, EA would do their ad buys across all three or four magazines. Acclaim would do their ad buys across all three or four magazines. And we knew that the TV show could be a weapon for Hmm. us, not only to influence getting more ad dollars, but to influence getting earlier scoops and exclusives over the other magazines. By, By going to Acclaim and saying, so we know you've got Mortal Kombat coming. If you give us the very first build, we'll guarantee you a spot on the TV show, plus put you in the magazine, and you just have to hold it off a month from EGM. Fighting dirty. Yeah. And so as an <laughs> editor, I saw that thing. I saw the, the show as a jewel. You know, It was just like I can talk. I, I was one of the people essentially doing the most talking to the – the developers and the publishers at that point, that was part of my job as senior editor. And so I was gathering the materials that we were going to use, you know, for the magazine. And it's like, if I can leverage this show and we can get a one month jump on AGM and the other magazines on anything good, 
then our magazine's the best magazine. We're we're gonna we're gonna start dominating in terms of circulation. Is that kind of like just going and talking to publishers? Is that where you think you got most of the knowledge that you later put to use when you started working in PR? Yeah, uh, I think that. I mean, you know, I was al- already a marketing major, and I had done some ad agency um, experience. You know, had some ad agency experience, so I already kind of knew the marketing thing, loved the marketing thing, and I had met with the early PR people from the first generation of gaming, the Mattel and television PR person, you know, the Atari 2600 person. So I knew what they did and, you know, what you had to do. And so, yeah, it was a lot of skills I was honing that helped make me a decent PR person. And among on your website, I see that you have a few listed uh, games that you did marketing for. I see Turok, I see Maniac Mansion, Dragon's Lair, NBA Jams, NBA Jam, and those are some heavy hitters. Like those are some of my favorite classic games. Yeah, uh, especially the, the, NBA Jam. The first part of my PR career was spent with um, some of the really big publishers, like Acclaim. And so, you know, if I was heading up PR for Acclaim, Acclaim's games, and that included Acclaim Sports. So you know, we had NBA Jam, we had NFL Quarterback Club, we had um, All Star Baseball. We had a lot of a lot of really good franchises um, and interesting athletes you know, that we were working with. Oh, we had, of course, the WWF franchise, now WWE. That probably became our most popular. And, and then eventually eventually, you, you started your own uh, public relations firm as well. Uh, can you tell me what that transition was? When I, after I left GamePro, I first launched an agency, but I was on the East Coast. And I was working with, um, you know, companies making Super Nintendo. They were making 3DO games. They were making Sega Genesis games. Um, I think I even had some arcade folks in that mix. After I did all the the big company stints with Acclaim and the 3DO company and Data East, I said, you know, maybe you should just do it on your own again. And then you can go about cherry picking your projects a little more. You know, you can go after things that you think you would want to play as a player versus things that are handed to you because you are part of the company and you have to PR the games of the company. Um, When you work for a company like Acclaim, well, you get some good stuff and then you get some real crap too. (laughs) Yeah. And that's hard for a PR person to have to, you know, to promote crap. Yeah. And I guess like what is it that you look for when you're considering taking on a game? I mean, personally, it, it was probably the same thing I looked for as when I was a journalist. It's like, mm. I want to play that game. <laughs> yeah. I want to play that game because it looks really interesting or it's really different or it's funny or it's just in the right genre that I know is the genre, genre that I love. Um, and so I want to play that game. And I think with PR, it's it's similar. You, you look for projects, you know, MMPR – we've done a lot of RPGs over the course of our history. And so we will look, if we see a good RPG out there, you know, it's in early stages of development. Um, we might just drop them a note and say, Hey, we've done this one and we did path of exile and we used to work on might and magic and here is a might and magic and maybe we can help you. Yeah, and I actually did play Path by Path of Exile when it came out back in the day. So yeah. that's that's one of the years that I've played actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody in the world has played Path of Probably, Exile yeah. at this point. Yeah. What's your favorite project that you've worked on? And I guess like also what is it about the work that you that you enjoy? I you know, I like Path of Exile because we were taking something from another country and we were introducing it to the world. And just the reaction, you know, first we were fighting the the free games or free to play games are all crap stigma, which was going on back when Path of Exile was trying to launch, sure, and having to break through that barrier, um, and so that was like a major PR victory in my mind. Um, the guys from from grinding your games were really good clients to work with. They were real knowledgeable about their game. They were really good on camera speaking about their game. They had a really excellent AAA product that they were essentially giving away to the world for nothing. Um, 
and then they would do you know three or four expansions new expansions per per year so brand new content for their free game <laughs> um that gave us opportunities to go out there and pr some more so it, it was a, a great experience um Another one, not as good a game, but certainly a more interesting story was probably um, we had a client who licensed Major League Eating and the Professional Eaters, and <laughs> they made a Wii, a Wii game, you know, with the motion control yeah. for professional eating, and that was <laughs> more not so much a high quality game, but a story as a PR person I could sell. Hmm. Interesting. And we managed to get that show and two of the eaters on the NBC Today show where I think we made we completely grossed out Kathy Lee Gifford. Perfect. <laughs> I, I, I seem to recall her turning green while she was watching <laughs> the, dem <laughs> the demonstration. Um, so, yeah, we got we got that game covered everywhere because it was a game you could talk about without necessarily being a, a gaming outlet. You know, yeah. Um, I think they Jay Leno used it or talked about it in his monologue during the Tonight Show. You know, <laughs> it was just you know when you have that that level of PR success, that's usually you know a good good happy memory <laughs> of sure. a project. So, yeah. Um, and you've you've been in in game uh, publishing and development for forever. Seems like over 30 years now. <laughs> forever yeah I, I guess what what i guess what are some of the differences that you see between what it you know used to be like making and publishing a game versus now i think the the big dividing line is when the internet sort of took over when the internet became the most important media that sort of changed the length of time between when you would show something for the first time and report it and when consumers would actually see it Right. And and whether it could go viral or you had to pass it, an issue of a magazine from person to person to person. So that that really changed a lot. Um, but it also changed the way we purchase games. You know, it used to be you'd have to you were beholden to the five or six major retailers that were out there. GameStop, Kitty City, Toys R Us, some, some of the department stores. And if you didn't have a good rapport with their buyer and you couldn't convince their buyer that your game was worth their shelf space, you were going to have a lot of trouble selling your game. Sure. <laughs> and then, and also because they were hard copies of games, you were essentially prepaying Nintendo or Sega or whoever was manufacturing your game and buying the game from them. And then you had to sell it through. And if you didn't sell it through, then you had to mark it down. And then you, at some point you start losing money per copy. Um, and now it's a, it's a lot different because digital has taken over and you don't have to have a retailer if you want to have a hit. Right. But on the flip side, it's a lot harder to stand out because the crowd is so much bigger. Right. The crowd is a, a lot bigger, but at least you don't have to give Nintendo millions and millions of dollars. This is true. Front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then have have, you know, all these cases of games come off a boat and then get onto trucks. And then, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's a whole kind of different ball game. I, I would say overall better. It, it's better for the developer. Um, it's probably better for the media. It's better for the PR person to be able to get their message out to consumers. You know, we don't have to send press releases via fax machine anymore. That's always a, an upgrade. <laughs> we don't do as many mailing packs to editors, you know, introducing game with, you know, special right. prize stuffed inside the envelope. Um, yeah, we don't have to do that so much anymore. Um, and what are you working on these days? Hmm. These days, well, we have the MMPR, we have um, a set of clients who have been with us for years and years. Um, Access Games is a, is a great client of ours. They're sort of the kings of the J Japanese game. They're really good at bringing great games from Japan over and localizing them for the West. Um, and they've actually built up a huge following of Atome they're probably the most responsible company for that boom that's going on with Atomi, the, the, the Japanese story soap opera type games. 
Um, so we've worked with them for years and years. We have a company called GS2 that does a number of games. They mostly take titles that had only been digital and either put them in packaging and or bring them out onto consoles that they haven't been on before. Um, and then we have a few others, you know, that pop in and out. We've worked on the Mutant Football League or the reboot of the Mutant Football League franchise um, on and off as, as it's happened. And then, you know, a number of other different projects. We, we tend to work with a lot of indies. Um, we, I think we were the agency that first got involved with indies way back in like 2003, 2004. Okay. There was this game called Alien Hominid. Um, if you're familiar with a, a developer called the Behemoth, rings a bell. They have a, a a website called Newgrounds where you can go onto Newgrounds and play all sorts of Flash games for free. Yep. and that's where Alien Hominid came out of. It was a oh. game that had gotten uh, about six million downloads, and the Behemoth decided they wanted to supersize it and make like a bigger version that they were going to put onto consoles. They ended up connecting with. Our client, who was this group of people that had jumped out of Capcom and had created like an independent publishing company that was going to find all these interesting little projects and bring them out on onto console. And so this was one of their first projects. Um, and we were PRing it. And so, yeah, the Alien Hominid, which then led the behemoth to do castle crashers. And then I can't remember what they did after that. That's the one I know. I know castle crashers. Yeah. And basically, Alien Hominid was became known enough that they were able to, you know, go completely independent and do their own thing. So you you were one of the first maybe uh, PR companies working with with uh, with indies because I feel like the the two thousands were really kind of a renaissance for for indies, small teams to publish full games. Yeah, you still you still didn't really have. Um, you didn't really have the digital distribution going on quite yet. It was still, you were still behold, you still needed a path to retail. Right. Um, so that, that's what their publisher was. Um, I think they were called O2, if I remember correctly, O2 or O3 or something. Um, but there was, maybe it was O3 and it was three people that had jumped ship from Capcom, <laughs> including Bill Gardner, who was Capcom USA's president at the time. Wow. Um, and I guess things didn't quite work out for the behemoth with O3. They got into all sorts of legal squabbles and things. But but we did our job on the PR side. We got we got <laughs> the game everywhere. So yeah. um and that, you know, hopefully that helped them get going because, you know, if if that hadn't worked, I guess we wouldn't have seen Castle Crashers and some of their other great games. Yeah. Yeah, Castle Crashers was a great game. Good times with uh playing couch co-op with friends on that one. Um, what's important to you about games? Well, it's kept me in business for my entire career. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I guess that's important. Sure. So I guess um, why games then? I think, I think games bring people together. You know, I, I, I've seen going all the way back to the arcades and the games that you would play against people to the games like wizard of war, which you really needed a good partner to cooperate. If you were going to succeed, it, it it's, it's an entertainment and social activity, but it really brings people together. You know, if you're online playing war to, world of Warcraft and you join some big guild, you've got all these, people that suddenly you know that you would have met maybe never met in a million years you know if everything was just local and there wasn't online gaming um we like to talk about games the way we talk about movies and tvs and you know tv shows good books music um you, you know so it gives us another spoke of the entertainment wheel to, for good conversation um, and then there's the collaboration side when you're making a game or you're working on a gaming project where you, you're rarely going to do anything by yourself in a vacuum. It just doesn't right. work that way. With I mean, there are definitely those wonderkin developers that develop one game by themselves over the course of seven years. You know, um, we were just talking about... Um, Montezuma's Revenge, you know, that classic game that w is is going to be rebooted. The kid who made it, he was 16 
You know, yeah. he did it all by himself and he yeah. brought it to Consumer Electronics Show. And I think Parker Brothers or somebody said, we'll take it. That's so cool. <laughs> we'll buy it. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, it, it's gaming brings folks together on a number of different levels. Um, and I guess it, it's a great respite from all the, the crap in the world, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and what what you said about bringing people together really rings true for me personally. My one of my best friends in college, we were in a World of Warcraft guild together, and he uh, he was far more involved than I was. But he 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 would stay up really late uh, chatting with one of our other guild members, uh, at, and they you know went back and forth. Eventually, ended up visiting each other, started dating, and believe it or not, today they are married and living happily. <laughs> together they met through world of warcraft and uh, are, are now um, starting a family so yeah it really does bring people together and i think uh that might seem like a foreign concept to people who are outside of gaming but but they they really do it's something that you could talk hours on end about if you yeah. find a kindred spirit yep. interested in talking to you about the other stuff that you like or know or and i you know i have daughters and all three of them have sort of fallen onto that path and the same thing has happened you know they they find a cluster of friends and what they have in common is gaming in yep. a lot of cases well we'll have to get you into the museum next time you're up at the bay with them um and if people if, if there's indies out there listening who who want to get in touch with you where can people find you online um you can go to mmpr.com and there's a lot of information on projects we've worked on both big and small um and then there's like a little you know fill out mailer type thing you can send a query to us that'll come directly to me um or you can just email me michael at mmpr.com and i'm i tend to be pretty quick responding to any kind of new biz inquiries um and yeah Michael, thank you so much for coming on the Maidcast. I uh, really appreciate you sharing uh, uh, your your stories of gaming history with us. Um, and uh, yeah, appreciate you coming on the show. Well, I, I shared some of my G-rated stories from <laughs> gaming history. We can save the R-rated ones for another day. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. All right. Great Thanks, Michael. Thank you for listening to the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment's official podcast. If you've got any thoughts, questions, corrections, or general museum ideas, shoot us an email at info at We'd like to send a big thank you to everyone who donated recently and to our Patreon supporters who help keep the maid afloat. Patreon donors get to listen to the podcast one week before it's released on major streaming services, and we'll continue to do that with future episodes every other week. This week's episode was brought to you in part by Patreon donors Trevor Adams, Kimberly Shannon, as well as Fowl and his pals. Thank you so much for your support. Until next time, I'm Jed. Thanks, and we'll see you in a couple weeks.